Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a look back at 2023. It is now December 31st, 2023. Happy New Year to everybody. New Year's Eve. And looking back on the year in classical music recordings, there were two really, really major developments that I think are worth chatting about for a moment. This, these were the acquisitions of BIS records by Apple Music and Hyperion records by Universal Music. Really shocking to many people in the classical music world. But to me, these acquisitions represent the final sort of nail in the coffin of the old financial model of classical music recordings. That is the potential profitability model. Now it seems to me classical music recordings will always be a charity. One way or another, they're a charity. I mean, classical recordings have always been subsidized in some way or another. That's how the independent classical music industry got going. Some of them in the United States are 501c3 corporations, which means that they're not-for-profit charitable foundations. And others, especially in Europe, have had symbiotic relationships with the subsidized national, for example, radio stations. CPO is perhaps the prime example of that. They've amassed a magnificent catalog, but they do no independent production work or very little independent production work of their own, but rather license things from the various German radio outlets that make tons and tons of recordings and pay for everything. And so CPO has only had to cover costs of production and making physical product and distribution. Even that is now going away. It's going away because the idea of, you know, pay to play, is, is virtually universal these days. In, spa, in fact, even universal, like Deutsche Grammophon, does not pay for most of its productions. They come ready-made, paid for by someone else. Maybe if they have you know a couple super-duper major artists who can be expected to sell a certain amount of recordings, yeah, they'll put in a little bit of money to pay for the production. But other than that, other than that, there's virtually no investment in classical recordings happening at any of the record labels, whether they're major labels or independent labels. That means, as far as these acquisitions go, that the major labels, in the case of Universal, are operating on the same financial basis as the independent labels. So there's no reason that they shouldn't start agglomerating more independent labels to themselves because it's not really costing them anything. There's an initial price to purchase the label of obviously who knows what it was but after that they operate in the same way let me explain a little bit what i mean it used to be back in the day that when a new recording was made the people who were operating at the label the producers the, the managers of the label the general manager would come up with a financial projection they would say hmm it's going to cost us X to make this recording. We're going to pay all the costs, hire the orchestra or pay for the studio. We have our own in-house engineers and we expect to sell X number of them and selling X number of them will generate Y amount of profit. And then they could determine whether or not it would make sense to do the project. That doesn't happen anymore. Now what they say is pay us, pay us X dollars to produce your recording. And, and we will use our distribution to distribute a recording. And what you get paid can be anything. You can stop the payment at simply the production, send us a finished product and we'll release it. Or it could be pay for not just the production yourself at your end, but also for our production of the CD and our distribution costs for X amount of time. And we'll do that. And this is only regarding physical product. I mean, nowadays, you don't even have to make physical products. Remember, you could offer things simply as streaming downloads, in which case there is no cost of physical product or production. You're paying simply for a digital master and, and maybe some artwork and production to make it look like it's coming out on Deutsche Grammophon or the label in question. That's all they have to do. They make a little cover. Maybe they hire someone to write some notes or they accept ready-made notes. There, there is no expense involved or very little expense involved 
the actual record label. And to keep the thing in the catalog costs nothing because there is no physical product. So there's no cost of production, there's no cost of warehousing, there's no cost of distribution. You just, I mean, there's an internal cost thing that they figure out, I'm sure, to like digitize and you know have a, a staff that, that manages this enormous database of digital recordings, but that can be done by a tiny, tiny number of people. And so the, the catalog management is where the expense is, where they have people who have to know what exists and what to release and how to release it, how to organize it, whatnot. And they do that very badly, as we all know, having looked at their digital download services. For Apple Music, the situation is entirely different. Apple Music, of course, is already a digital music delivery service. It does not deal with physical product at all. And so acquiring BIS leaves open the question of whether or not how long digital product will remain, I mean, physical product will remain available. It will be available digitally, of course. They want this catalog because they want to try and corner the market on classical music delivery. I have no idea why. I'm not quite sure what these people think they're doing by wanting to be, you know, the classical delivery service when everybody has the same repertoire and is doing basically the same thing. Although, although BIST is a boutique label and has a lot of unique repertoire too, but I'm not sure that Apple quite understood that or cares. I really don't. What they have is a ready-made, excellent catalog, which they can they can use proprietarily. And that may be where the new, the new angle is because, because the amount of income that they're going to generate, actual income is incremental. It's very, very small, but it's, it aggregates over an enormous catalog of stuff. And if they own the product, then the income is all theirs. They don't license it. They don't have to share it with anybody other than, you know, whether or not the artists get anything. But in most of these, in most of these, productions nowadays, there aren't even royalties. You know, they pay outright for the production. It's a fixed cost and that's the end of it. And so Apple now has BIS. They have something that they own, which is, which is, belongs to them. And they can use that as, as the, the core of a boutique streaming service, which we'll see what they do with it and we'll see how that operates. But what really strikes me is the total shift in the production model, in the way that these companies operate. Everyone has given up on the fact that classical music is a profit-making business in the old sense, in the fact that the, the owner of the recording, the owner of copyright to the recording, has some sort of investment in actually selling it, like making money. I'm not saying, frankly, that this is good or bad. What I'm saying and what fascinates me is the way that the industry has shifted so as to maintain this unbelievable output of recordings. It really doesn't matter where the money is. The money may not be coming from the record labels, be investing in their artists, investing in developing a catalog, investing in anything. They're all just open boutiques where you, they can tell the artist, you go raise the money, you go find a sponsor, go find some form of subsidy, do something like that. And, and our label has a certain brand equity, a certain cachet. And if you want to be on our label, then this is what it's going to cost you to do it. You pay us and we will release your stuff. It's an abdication of responsibility in the sense that in the sense that these labels will have a much more limited say on the quality and and development quality of product and the development of their catalog because they're taking things ready made. They're not actively involved in creating a catalog. I mean, Hyperion will who knows what's going to be with Hyperion now Universal is more in the business of traditional record label management, however badly they do it. So it may be that Hyperion will continue for a while. BIS, I have no idea what's going to happen. And I'm very curious to see how they continue projects that characterize that label. I mean, BIS became a label, a thing, 
because of these grandiose projects that they achieved as independent labels, granted with lots of subsidy and other help. But yes, it was their vision to do the complete Sibelius cycle, to do these big projects, the complete Greek piano music, and all of the Scandinavian composers and these various editions and things. How that will continue under the aegis of Apple, I have no idea whatsoever. It all depends on how much Apple is willing to invest in maintaining the reputation and tradition that characterize the label. And that, in turn, is going to depend on how much money they can earn on whatever platform they attempt to sell and distribute the product. Um, it's going to be fun to watch. I do not believe, and I, I've, I've written this when people have asked, you know, everyone in the classical music industry is in a perpetual state of crisis. Right. I mean, I I joke about Norman Lebrecht's prediction 20 some odd years ago that this is the last year of classical music. It's all, it's all bullshit. The industry finds ways to maintain the volume of stuff. Why? Because artists want to get their products out to the public somehow. And so the mechanism of financing changes. But the volume of stuff out there. I mean, it hasn't changed at all, not for decades. It's just tons and tons and tons of stuff. In fact, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger because, because the hegemony of major classical labels and of physical product meant that there was an investment that had to be made by a third party, by a label. Now, the investment is all made by the artists. And so there's, there's no control over what's coming out. There's just tons and tons of stuff out there and people shopping around for outlets for stores where they could shove their stuff and have it issued and they're willing to pay to do it. So I see no diminution, that's the word, lessening, I can never get that word right, the lessening of the amount of product coming. And I do see a lessening in the quality of product, not that it's gonna be bad, it's always like, okay, right? I mean, most of it's competent, but, but the people who are determining what gets made and what gets released are no longer specialist executives with a vision of what a classical music label should be, what repertoire is necessary, what a catalog should look like. All of that's gone. So it's going to be a free for all, a digital free for all with the downloading things and digi bits flying around all over the place. And it's going to be fun to keep track of it and impossible. I suspect that's why I'm the moment sticking to doing as much physical product as possible. Although I listen to digital downloads quite often because how are we going to keep track of this stuff? Haven't a clue, haven't a clue, but we'll do our best and we shall keep on listening. So happy new year. Take care and see you next year.